This is a short video on the various cardiac imaging modalities. I'm going to be going over a brief overview of the clinical methods of visualizing the heart. And the different modalities that we're going to be talking about are listed down on the left here. We're going to start off talking about chest x-rays. We're going to talk about echocardiograms, the different ways to get echocardiograms, such as TTE and TEE. We're going to go into myocardial perfusion imaging. We're going to look at MRI that's specific for the heart, catheterization for diagnostic and treatment purposes, as well as cardiac CT. So this is just a preview of these six imaging modalities. We're going to jump into each of them in more detail, tell you what they're good for, tell you some advantages, some disadvantages, and show you some examples of the pictures that could be obtained with each of these modalities. So let's begin with chest x-ray, often abbreviated as CXR. For, uh, for billing purposes, chest x-ray, very commonly used, dates back over 100 years ago, first used to diagnose TB. So if you saw cloudiness in the lungs, you knew there might be some, some bacterial infiltrate there. It's used to differentiate or resolve objects based on density. And this is just based on the physical principles of x-rays passing through the chest. So a high density object, like a bone or metal, appears white. That's why you see a skeleton on an x-ray. A low density object, such as a gas or gas in your lungs, appear black because the X-rays pass through those objects or that or that material uh, with, without without reflecting much. So water-based tissues, which make up the majority of the bodies, are so the majority of the body is somewhere in between those two, somewhere between black and white. One downside to the chest X-ray is that you cannot resolve cardiac structures, but you do see a silhouette of the heart. This means that if you know the general positioning of the heart and the general anatomy of the heart, you can still deduce certain things based on this silhouette. And you can still calculate cardiac ratio. Now cardiac ratio, if you look over at this top right image, you can see the image of a heart here. The cardiac ratio is that horizontal distance that the heart takes up divided by the horizontal distance of the entire chest cavity. So in this top left image here, we could see a normal size heart. If we look down to this bottom image, we see a heart that's much larger. This heart on the bottom has a cardiac ratio that's larger than 50%, meaning that the width of the heart is bigger than 50% of the width of the chest cavity. So that's an example of cardiac megaly, an enlargement of the heart. You can also see a pacemaker in that bottom right image. Chest x-ray can also be used to identify manifestations of lung disease or of heart disease in the lungs. This includes pleural edema and pulmonary effusion. So oftentimes when we see cloudiness at the base of the lungs where that pointer is now, this can be an indication of congestive heart failure, of fluid in the lungs as a result of heart problems. And just kind of in summary, chest x-ray is cheap. There's a small radiation exposure. It's just one quick x-ray, and it's used frequently in the emergency room when people present with chest pain. Let's move, move on over to echocardiograms. There's a lot to cover here, a lot of different methods. You can see some moving images here too. Basic principle is that ultrasound waves are emitted from piezoelectric transducers, and those emitted ultrasound waves bounce off tissues. The reflected ultrasound waves are then measured, processed by a computer, and made into an image. Because we're dealing with pressure waves here, there's no big risk or toxicity like we had with x-ray, uh, and, and like we'll see with, with cardiac CT especially. There's a low cost to echocardiograms, so that's another benefit. The two main types are transthoracic echocardiogram, TTE, or transesophageal echocardiogram. Now this picture at the top here, that red one, is an example of TEE, transesophageal. And there's essentially a probe that goes down into the esophagus. That probe has both the ultrasound transducers and the ultrasound receivers that can get a better angle at the heart. Otherwise, the ultrasound transducer and receiver is placed directly onto the chest uh, through the through the sternum and the ribs to access the heart and to get an image of the heart that way 
TEE is specifically good for excluding intracardiac thrombus, for ruling out the presence of an intracardiac clot. Now, when we do echocardiograms, you can either have one beam, which would give you one line of resolution, or you could have multiple beams portrayed in an arc, like these images here, and get a two-dimensional image of what's going on. These images at the bottom just kind of show you the different orientations of the heart that, that you can get pictures of using echocardiograms. And I believe that these were taken using a uh, standard trans thoracic echocardiogram, a TTE. They also have methods these days of finding, of making three-dimensional images, um, and that's all with the image processing on the computer. Doppler echocardiography is specifically used to look at blood flow, and its advantage is that you can identify turbulent regions. I believe it's specifically used for looking at valvular diseases and valvular abnormalities. So Doppler should be associated with valvular abnormalities. Next we have myocardial perfusion imaging. This is essentially the use of a heavy element radioisotope. Um, there's a few of them that you could use to mark areas of myocardial perfusion. Now perfusion in the biological sense is the ability to deliver blood to the capillaries. We want to be able to give blood to the heart muscle and we kind of assess where the cardiac or the coronary arteries are delivering blood with a heavy element radioisotope. So we expose uh, the, we expose the heart muscle to stress after it's, uh, after it's perfused with these radioisotopes. And you can kind of see the result of a stress test at the bottom here. The top row of images shows many heart muscles under stress, and the bottom row shows the same heart muscle under rest. If we see a big discrepancy between these images, we know that there is a uh, there's a part of the heart that is not being perfused, that is not getting as much blood as it should. And this could be, of course, a risk for a heart attack. It could indicate ischemia, which is the death of tissues, uh, usually due to the lack of blood. And as we said, this is a nuclear stress test because we're using a heavy element radioisotope and we have imaging before and after the stress to identify areas of the heart that are not being well perfused during stress. We also have cardiovascular MRIs. This applies the same principles of MRIs, which is magnetic fields and radio waves, to, uh, to form images of a body. It can be used to find, uh, to, to, to make moving images and still images. Downside to MRI is, as usual, pretty expensive. We have moving and still images, as we said. The best part about cardio or cardiovascular MRI is uh, using it to assess cardiac structure and function. And we can see some pretty good images of the heart beating here. Uh, we have some small animations and uh, there's, there's pretty clear contrast between tissues, which is something you don't get with CT or x-rays. And that's one of the major benefits of MRIs. Next, we have cardiac catheterization. It's a, it's, a, it's a domain of, of procedures that involves insertion of the catheter into the chambers of the heart or the vessels of the heart. We can use this for therapeutics or diagnostics. One example of therapeutics is inserting stents through cardiac catheterization. When one of the downsides of cardiac catheterization is that it is invasive. It's not quite as invasive as surgery, but it does involve putting a wire and a catheter. Uh, uh, it's... it's, it's done under anesthesia, but the patient is still awake, so it's a local anesthesia. And um, it, there is radiation exposure if you are using a contrast agent in the coronary arteries. Right heart catheterization involves the insertion of a catheter through the vein, usually the femoral vein, and it's used to measure the right heart pressure or the pulmonary artery pressure. And this makes sense because if we're going through the veins and we're going up to the heart, we're going to enter through the inferior vena cava into the right atrium and into the right ventricle. And we can even keep going into the pulmonary artery to measure pressures there. So that's the main use of right heart catheterization. So as we said, right heart catheterization is best for assessing intracardiac pressures, and it can also be used to look at cardiac output. 
Left heart catheterization is, is performed by inserting a catheter through an artery, usually in the arm. And of course, if we go through the artery back up to the heart, we're going to go backwards, retrograde is the term they use, through the aorta into the left ventricle and the left atria. Now, if we go into the left ventricle and release a dye, a dye that can be seen using an x-ray, that dye is then going to be pumped out of the left ventricle into the aorta and into the coronary arteries. The coronary arteries will then perfuse around the heart and we can get these nice angiography images as you see on the right here. These angiography images show the blood vessels, the arteries, the coronary arteries going around the heart muscle and feeding the tissue of the heart muscle. So coronary angiography um, using left heart catheterization is the best way to visualize the coronary arteries and to identify stenosis. And if you look carefully at these images on the, on the right here, we see the white arrows pointing to, to areas of stenosis in the coronary arteries, to areas that show the dye is kind of cut off, is kind of blank for a moment, indicating that there's not much blood, there's not much fluid passing through the arteries at the point that the arrow is indicating. And lastly, we have cardiac CT. CT is computed tomography, and um, cardiac is obviously computed tomography of the heart, uh, which is a more complicated x-ray. It's not quite as simple as a normal chest x-ray. It's a uh, series of x-rays that are, that are put together by a computer to produce an image and can also be used to produce a three-dimensional image. Cardiac CT is best to assess the extent of coronary stenosis. So we can identify coronary stenosis best using cardiac catheterization. We can, we can assess the extent of stenosis. We can get a higher resolution picture and see just how bad that artery is being, uh, is being clogged up using cardiac CT. Cardiac CT is also good to look at the thoracic aorta. So if we have any kind of aorta problems, such as an aortic dissection, cardiac CT can identify that. The benefit of cardiac CT is that it's less invasive than catheterization. You're not actually putting anything into the body, and you can also produce a three-dimensional model, which is something that catheterization cannot do. And the drawbacks of CT are, are pretty intense radiation exposure, uh, more so than chest x-rays and more so than MRIs. And of course, to get some, some pretty images, you usually have to use contrast that can damage the kidneys. So that's all we have for these imaging modalities of the heart. I hope this was helpful, and thank you for listening.